Hey everybody, welcome to Fiction Factory, the official podcast of Get Dangerous Games, creators of the Shadows tabletop role-playing game. I'm Scott, one of the designers for Shadows, and in this episode we're continuing our series in which we explore the many character archetypes found in the gritty and dangerous world of Night City. If you missed our last episode, we took a look at the cyborg, a staple of the cyberpunk genre. I really recommend you check that episode out because not only is the cyborg my personal favorite archetype, but the customization available is really intense and unique to Shadows. Of course, you can find all of our episodes by checking out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at decode, or by getting us directly on Spotify in the podcast section under Get Dangerous. So in this episode, we'll be finishing off the human or mortal archetypes and jumping in with both feet to the professional, which is another archetype that's pretty unique to Shadows. Playing a professional is kind of like, well, taking an NPC and making it your own character. Professionals come in all shapes and sizes, and in Shadows, they're the ones you'd call to get the job done. The professional is the most involved archetype in our game, and in this episode, I'll do my best to try and break down each of the different professions, discuss their unique qualities, how they fit into Night City, and give you an idea of how you and your character can turn your passion into a paycheck. So whether you're a seasoned RPG player or new to the genre, I think you'll find something to enjoy in this series. Buckle up, grab your dice, and get ready to explore the shadows of Night City. So, the professional. You're thinking, another human, right? Another boring, basic human. But wait, there's a twist here. Humans may not have the magical powers or superhuman strength of their counterparts, but they do have something else going for them. The ability to hustle and survive in a world full of cybernetic and supernatural threats. And let's face it, if you look around at the world you're in right now, not all humans are created equal. Some are straight up badass, capable of taking on the toughest of foes with nothing but their wits and skills. In Shadows, these folks are known as professionals, and they make their living doing gigs and odd jobs that require off-the-books expertise and black market connections. So if you think you're tough enough to stand toe-to-toe with werewolves and wizards, cyborgs and vampires, and all sorts of other terrifying creatures from beyond, then step up, prove yourself. But keep in mind that in the world of Shadows, and in Night City, survival isn't just about being strong. It's about being smart and resourceful too. Professionals are specialists, and they come in all shapes and sizes with different abilities and skill sets. Some are cleaners, masters of murder for hire, who can cover their tracks and make any kill look like an accident. Others are decoders, experts in the capture and sale of critical data, who can control the outcomes of society by controlling the flow of information. And then you've got our digilantes, those who fight on the front lines of the information wars that engulf Night City. Despite their lack of raw power or magical abilities, professionals have the skills to pay the bills, so to speak. They may not be able to match a werewolf in strength, but they know how to find its weaknesses and where they can grab those silver bullets. They may not be able to manipulate the ether like a mage, but they know how to hack the link and find the information that they need, which in some cases might be just as good. They may not have the speed and ferocity of a vampire, but they are hardened, unyielding predators who can do incredible things that most would consider impossible. Ultimately, the human experience in Shadows is unique, presenting a challenge that only the most resourceful and determined individuals can overcome. Professionals are those individuals combining their passions with their paychecks to become the best in the field. So whether you're a cleaner, a vigilante, or a slayer, all professionals have two clear goals in mind, getting paid and staying alive long enough to cash the check. Are you ready to join the ranks of the best in the business? That's the best part about professionals. They're human, and they have many of the same characteristics as the garden variety person who's behind the counter of the corner store trying to get you to spend 30 credits on a pack of menthols. But the difference here is that maybe professionals have picked up a little tech, a little bit of magic, and uh, they might be a little more robust than your average human. Unfortunately, the lifestyle that they've chosen means that they're often right in the thick of it and may not last as long as their counterparts who are content to stay in the background behind the scenes. When you make the decision to play a professional, you really are signing up for a complicated lifestyle with its own unique set of skills, powers, and resources. Everybody in Night City is doing what they can to get by, 
professionals just know how to do it a little bit better than the average corpo or net jockey. One of the unique elements of the professional is that there are a lot of different professions. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got cleaners and decoders and vigilantes, enforcers, fixers, a jack of all trade, a mercenary, a skipper, a slayer, a true warrior, and a wheelman. What are all these titles here? Well, in a sense, they're like a build that you'd have for a character class in another type of game. Um, they're all under the professions, uh, professional's archetype. And what sets each of these different professions apart, like the difference between a cleaner and a decoder, for example, is that each of these different professions has their own unique set of prerequisites. Not everybody who walks in off the street can be a professional. There's a difference between your friend in high school who knows how to drive a car really well and a wheelman, right? You wouldn't hire that guy to do a job, but a wheelman has a reputation to uphold. They've got a fancy car, they've got a fast car, and they know the ins and outs of the roads around their heist. This is because professionals not only have prerequisites that they have to meet, but they also have focus skills. Focus skills are skills that you have spent a lot of time working on. They are special for your profession. And the way that that's reflected mechanically is that the cost to upgrade a focus skill is reduced versus uh, the regular person who's upgrading that skill. So if you are a cyborg and you want to upgrade your tech skill from rank three to rank four, that's going to cost you five IP per level in order to upgrade. So if you're going from three to four, you'll have to spend 15 IP to increase that rank. If you're a professional and this is a focused skill, you only have to spend three IP per level to upgrade. So instead of spending 15, you'd be spending nine. And since IP is really the currency of self-improvement in this game, that makes a huge difference. It means that professionals, even though they may not have, you know, the ability to like fling fireballs out of the air or, uh, you know, hulk out with uh, cybernetics and grow fangs and levitate and all those things, they're going to be the most skilled people around. Another element that professionals have is a tweak. And like I said, this is that little unique element that separates an enforcer from your standard garden variety Night City security force. Uh, a wheel a wheelman from that friend who's really good at driving, like I said. Uh, tweaks are things that give them that extra edge. And when combined with the tools of the trade, the other last feature of a professional, it really creates this nice complementary skill set where a professional is the person that you call when you need to get the job done. If you watched any sort of movie where there's a heist or, you know, a group kind of bringing the band together in order to accomplish a goal, and there's always that person who says, oh, I know a guy who we need for this. One of my favorites would say be Ocean's Eleven where they're assembling their team for the big heist and they're tagging each of those different people. This one can do the cameras. This one is the confidence man. This one's really good at driving all those things. Those are professionals. So I'll go through each of the professionals here and give you an idea of what they bring to the table. They're the ones who make problems disappear. They're hired to eliminate obstacles that stand in their way, whether that's a person, information, or evidence, they make problems go away. They're skilled in different forms of combat, and they possess exceptional situational awareness. Cleaners aren't just people off the street, though. They might work for a powerful criminal organization quickly to changing circumstances. If you want to be a cleaner, you've got to have a reflex of at least eight and a body of at least six. This is uh, reflecting your physical prowess of taking on the job and taking out your opponents. The tweak that cleaners have available to them is vanish. And what that means is that you have the ability to kind of fade into the background. Mechanically speaking, this gives you a bonus to any stealth checks that you make. And uh, it doesn't protect you from supernatural abilities like aura side or life sense, but it does mean that you can commit a job, run into the middle of the streets of Night City, and without much effort, fade into the distance. For focused skills, cleaners have stealth and two combat skills of your choice. So whether you prefer a sniper rifle or a handgun or some martial arts weapons, the cleaner's ability to 
take out an opponent and blend into their surroundings is what really sets them apart from the other professions. For the tools of the trade, they get to choose one loadout from the gear section. And a loadout is essentially a... Next, moving away from kind of the combat-oriented professional, we've got a pair, Decoder and Digilante. They're kind of like two sides of the same coin. Decoders specialize in capturing and selling critical information. So this would kind of be a hacker if you were looking at it from another angle. Um, in a society like Night City, where information is power and corporations are constantly vying for every last shred of information they can get, decoders are the ones that they call in. Uh, decoders are very good at exploiting gaps in security, uh, going into places where they shouldn't be to get the information that they shouldn't have, and then getting out cleanly. The prerequisites for a decoder is an intelligence of eight and a reflex of six. And their tweak is backup plan. Essentially, what a decoder has is the ability to jump in, get what they need, and then back out, all in software in the link. By rolling a successful interface check opposed to the AI or the link gate encryption, they get the ability to escape the grid without detection. The focus skills for a decoder are interface, basic tech, and electronic security, and this reflects their ability to make a uh, version of the internet that's available in Night City. But it kind of serves as the flow of information and access points for all of the major corporations, governments, and everything that are operating in Night City. Decoders and digilantes have ways to navigate the link beyond just the regular user. So they're the ones that you would see navigating almost on a Tron type level, not where their physical body is necessarily involved, but they are accessing it and putting themselves at great risk. And depending on the type of security system on the other end of the link and the sites that they're trying to access, it could actually cause them physical harm, especially if they go brain deep into the link. The next group we'll talk about are digilantes. So like I said, the digilante and the decoder are kind of two sides of the same coin. And these are your groups that are very technically motivated using their knowledge and skills to access the link and get what information they can to the most number of people and take down oppressive sensors and monitors who try to control the flow of information. Digilantes are your vigilantes for the digital world fighting on the front lines, of the information wars. If you'd want to be a digilante, you've got to have an intelligence of eight and a reflex of seven. And your focus is on interface, basic tech, and streetwise, because not only do they know how to get access to information, but they know what to do with it to cause the greatest impact once they've gotten out of the system. For Tweak, digilantes are secured uh, both physically and digital sewer system in a tower. Maybe it's in their office building after hours, who knows? But this is a secured place that's got an encrypted gate, proxy designations to conceal its location from outsiders, and two different countermeasures of their choice to protect against intrusion. Tools of the trade for the Digilante is also a mid-quality smart deck used to access the link, but in this case, they've got bodyguard software. Uh, this would be protecting against anyone trying to track them down and expose them. Then you've got our enforcers. So flipping back to the more physical, combat-oriented side of things, enforcers are those who are brought in to physically impose themselves uh, against others. They might work for the federal government. They might be the right hand of a local gang or something like that. Um, but they are the lifebloods of self-discipline. They are great others to listen. The focus skills for the enforcer are authority, investigation, and survival. The enforcer is the one that you would want at your side if you had a high value target that you were trying to protect. The tweak here is known quantities. Basically, enforcers are really good at cutting through the BS that surrounds others. And on a successful human perception check against somebody else's opposing deception check, they get an insight as to what that person is thinking, what their motivations are and they get a bonus of 1d4 to all combat checks against that opponent. They get a really good sense of who that person is out and an encrypted slate that they can use to communicate with others on their team. 
Next up, we've got the Fixer. Now, <laughs> the Fixer is another classic that you'll see in uh, cyberpunk and in a lot of kind of crime and heist oriented sets of fiction. Basically, the fixer is who you call when you say, hey, I know a guy. This is the person who's really well connected. This is someone who can get you the bootleg vehicles, equipment, weapons, all the things that you'll need for your day-to-day -day ops. Uh, they're kind of the glue of the underworld, and they serve as a liaison or go-between between the real world and the link. They'll usually partner with decoders or hackers who've got critical access to information, and they serve as brokers there. Um, and they're the ones that would kind of give you the lead when they've got, you know, something that you need to steal or acquire. You need to set up passwords to get past an encrypted gate, things like that. That would be your fixer. Prerequisites for a fixer are an intelligence of seven and a magnetism of seven. And this is because they are focused in on streetwise, street deal, and basic tech. They're the ones who are moving and shaking uh, in the underworld, and they are great allies to have. If you are playing as a fixer, one of the cool features that you have is you've got a little shop where you do operations. So, of course, as a player character, you're not going to spend all of your time um, being a non-player character sitting at your shop. So maybe you've got staff that you check in with regularly. Um, the shop is a small single shop room with different wares in it. You can kind of decide what that will be. But your tweak is that it's in the back. There's always a chance that there's something fell off a truck and landed in the back of your shop. At character creation, there's a 30% chance plus your intelligence score that there's something you need in the back. And whenever you need to get access to that special MacGuffin, the tool, the key card, the unique ammo, whatever it is that your character needs in the game, you can kind of make a check against that feature that it's in the back. Um, over time, you can boost this through minor milestones or major milestones, and the maximum you can get to is 80%. So even if your shop gets fully outfitted and ready for anyone to shop in, there's always a chance that you won't have anything in stock. Next, we move to the jack of all trades. And if you thought that skills was a big focus for the other professions, the jack of all trades is really where that comes into focus. Um, if you are the type of person who likes being a quote unquote skill monkey, and maybe you really enjoyed being a rogue in other games or, you know, or a bard where they get access to a lot of skill points, Jack of all trades may be the one for you. Uh, this is a person who kind of drifts between kind of filling in whatever spots are needed on the team. Uh, the Jack of all trades can learn a lot about a lot of different things really quickly, which makes them valuable in ways that most people don't really understand. Um, because they are you know, not specialists in any specific area, they have to have a high intelligence of eight and a reflex of six, and they get to choose their focus skill. So depending on how you want to run your jack of all trades, um, you can choose the skills that align with that. Now I will say in our current season of Shadows, uh, Ken or Kaza is playing a jack of all trades character, Hugh Mann, and he's an investigator who uses his wide range of connections and skills to track down uh, supernatural and magical artifacts and people and help out the community. He serves as a go-between with the community there. For the Jack of all trades, their tweak is master of none. So skills are easier to acquire, but they meaning that they cost less, but they're harder to master. So it costs a little bit more to level up your skills. But what's nice about the Jack of all trades is that the way that the synergy system works, which is our unique system in shadows, once you've been trained in a skill, you just have one rank in that skill. It enables you to add a synergy bonus from your stats. So for example, let's say a weapon uses reflex as its base primary stat and then cool as its secondary stat. If you've been trained in that weapon, you get to apply bonuses from both reflex and cool. If you're not trained in that weapon, you're just relying on your reflex. So what happens here is that the jack of all trades can spread out their knowledge base and pretty much any weapon they pick up, any situation they encounter, they get to apply their maximum potential to that situation, which I think is pretty cool and unique to role-playing games. 
um, having a character like this. So the tweak here, Master of None, means that skills ranked one to four cost only your level times three IP. Basically, every skill for you is a focused skill for those first few levels. However, once you start specializing and going to rank five and higher, it costs the same cost as it does for everybody else, plus 10 more IP. So essentially, you're paying for two ranks higher than everybody else would. What's cool here, though, is that the tools of the trade for you as a jack of all trades means that you get to choose a favored toolkit, choose a loadout, and a unique item that works with your character concept. And this is where you'd really want to work with the GM to make sure that the character you're crafting fits in the world. Um, if you are choosing someone that doesn't really fit in the world, then the GM will let you know. Uh, but this is kind of a cool element there. And I really like the jack of all trades. I feel like a lot of people will start there before they specialize somewhere else. Next, we move on to the mercenary. Mercenary is typically someone who's a former soldier of some kind, a former police officer, perhaps. They're the ones who are the best at fighting. Uh, they must have a reflex of seven and a body of six. Their focus skills are combat sense, handgun, and rifle. Uh, mercenaries go and do what they're told. They are guns for hire, literally. And their tweak is that they are battle-hardened. Because they have been in the thick of it and seen battle firsthand, in the field, they know what to do. And when they are surprised, if you manage to surprise them, they gain a bonus of plus two to all of their defensive combat actions. And if they manage to get ambushed, they have a plus three. So it's hard to get a drop on a mercenary. And uh, the additional bonus effect here is that because of what they've been through, mercenaries get to choose a secondary effect that they are immune to. So this could be being stunned, disoriented, or knocked down. Um, because they've been through so much and they've experienced so much, they've kind of developed a resistance to being stunned. It's a really interesting idea. For the tools of the trade for the mercenary, they get to choose one loadout from the gear section. So again, they get to choose the tools that they're most comfortable with using along with uh, having skills in combat sense, handgun, and rifle. Next, we're moving to somewhat of a supernatural sort of creature. Uh, not necessarily a creature, but we have the skipper. This is a profession that is really cool, in my opinion. Um, basically, there are ley lines, uh, metaphysical causeways that go through the route of Night City. And skippers have figured out how to tap into those ley lines using portals, essentially, to jump from one area to the other in Night City. These skippers are the ones who know how to manipulate them. A skipper is really useful for getting in and out around the city, for doing recon work if you need it. Uh, they've got an intelligence of seven and a cool of eight. And that cool is reflecting how well they're able to traverse the supernatural uh, gateways that are throughout Night City. For focus skills, they are focused on awareness, legend lore, and occult lore. Now, awareness is just your general awareness of things around you. Sight, smell, sound, you know, all those different things. Legend lore and occult lore reflects your knowledge of things that are kind of real in a sense, like mythical creatures and things that come out of stories and legends. So, you know, knowledge of dragons and goblins and things like that, that would uh, generally be accepted as part of the human uh, historical experience, but still fantastical. And then occult lore looks at that more, let's say, eldritch supernatural side of things. So you would be using occult lore to understand the Neverlands and other pocket dimensions, supernatural creatures from beyond our understanding, uh, beyond just vampires and werewolves, um, but things of that nature. So the skipper kind of taps into that other side of the human experience, the side that is really hidden behind the veil, and they make it their own. The tweak for a skipper is Gatewatcher, and this gives them a 1d4 bonus to awareness checks to detect the presences of a skip gate. And a skip gate is that little dimensional portal that they can use to hop around the city. 
um, because they are so familiar with skip gates and have been traveling around using them, they don't have any disorientation side effects. So they don't get the, the debility disorientation when they use a skip gate. Uh, anybody else who's going through a skip gate who's unfamiliar with them will take a minute or two to regain their senses after they've traveled that way. The tools of the trade, each skipper starts with two gate passes and a skipper charm, which can be used to create additional gate passes. Next, kind of leaning into that supernatural side of things, we have the Slayer. Uh, the Slayer is basically the Night City Shadows version of The Witcher, if you're familiar with those novels, TV series, and games. Um, they are highly specialized in the very hazardous profession of dealing with supernatural threats. Uh, those who are choosing to take on the life of a slayer know how to anticipate where danger is lurking. They can confront the horrors of the unknown fearlessly. A skipper and a slayer are a great pair of partners to have when you are traversing the uh, skip gates and neverlands of Night City. Surviving as a slayer really ends up building a reputation around yourself and people know to bring you in when the threats go beyond the mundane. Um, skippers have the most intense set of prerequisites um, by having a reflex of six, a body of seven, and an empathy, or re sorry, a reflex of six, a body of five, and an empathy of seven. And this empathy is what helps them keep a uh, grip on their sanity and to understand human nature a little bit more. For focus skills, like I said, they're kind of on the combat side of the supernatural coin with the skipper. Uh, they're focused on combat sense, occult lore, and then one combat skill of their choice. This is their tweak of sixth sense. Basically, they have developed an intuition of how supernatural creatures will engage in combat. Whenever they face a supernatural creature in battle, they gain a plus 1d4 to all combat checks against that opponent. Um, this is only when fighting against a supernatural creature, so they're fighting against a, a mundane creature. Um, even an arcanist, it does not apply. The tools of the trade for them are two bane charms, which help protect them against supernatural threats, uh, weapon of choice, and then light full body armor to give them a little bit of protection. Uh, like I said, slip uh, skipper and slayer together is a pretty cool combination they know how to get in defeat whatever foe they're facing and get back out the true warrior is next on our list of professionals um, this is someone who has devoted themselves to close quarters combat um, probably the closest you would see to like a monk type class or archetype in shadows um, they have focused themselves on powering, uh, basically they, they've developed SFR. They've developed that spiritual force rating. They're the only humans to really do so. And it's because they have looked so deeply within that they have been able to manifest a chi of sorts. Um, they've devoted themselves to martial arts and are committed to it among all other things. They hold very tightly to some old code or ethics, so Bushido, Shaolin, or even something more modern. Um, they must take that sort of oath, though, and adhere to it. Uh, the consistent thread, regardless of how a true warrior presents themselves and what weapons they use, is that they are always devoted, physically fit, and have access to the power of life when they need to. For prerequisites, a True warrior must have a reflex of seven and a body of eight, which will make them well-versed in any type of combat style that they choose. Um, they have focus skills of combat sense and then two martial arts skills. Uh, martial arts skills are in the regular skill set. Anybody can access them. Um, but what they do is they give you advantages in certain types of attacks that you might do. Their tweak is a power style. So this is where we cross closely into that supernatural, uh, just like we did with the Slayer and the Skipper. Martial artists, like true warriors, can tap into chi, which is this kind of pseudo-magical ability. It's very much tied to their training and their physical body. And as a result, they can do things that often seem to bend or break 
the laws of physics and reason. Essentially, they get a small pool of SFR that they can burn in combat. Their SFR is a base of 10 plus their will, and their rate of use, in which they can burn at a time, is 1 plus their body bonus. So since their body is already starting out as a minimum of 8, uh, which would be a plus 2, uh, they start out with a rate of use of 3, at least. Of course, they can exceed this by having a higher body. Um, but when they burn SFR, they gain one of the following four effects. Uh, they can choose to activate Fleet of Foot, which would give them a plus 30 yards per round in a run and sprint for one round. So essentially they would tap into it and become super fast for a few seconds to be able to jet to the other side of a battlefield or you know stop a gate from closing, something like that. Um, they get They can choose to take on Untouchable, which would give them one bonus per point that they spend to the next defensive combat check for one round. So the big bad is gearing up their gigantic attack. The true warrior taps in, burns all their SFR, and gets a huge bonus to their defense to try and avoid or withstand the attack. Uh, alternatively, they can power their SFR into an attack of their own and take on Power Strike, which would gain plus one withering damage per point of SFR that they spend to the next successful strike that they make. Uh, withering damage, I mentioned a few different times in other episodes, but basically this is a severe form of damage that supernatural creatures would take that they're not allowed to regenerate from. It has to heal naturally. So an example would be uh, like sunlight or silver, or, you know, might present withering damage to a werewolf or a vampire. Um, the ability to channel that into a strike from your hand or from your weapon is critical to success in a fight with a supernatural creature. And then the last power that a true warrior can tap into is uncanny aim. So depending on the type of weapon that you're using, maybe you're using a longbow or crossbow, um, you could get plus one accuracy per point of SFR that you spend to the next ranged weapon attack that you'd make. Um, all of this is just pretty cool, and it's a way for a professional to tap in. Um, you would have somebody perhaps like Iron Fist, as poorly as he was represented in uh, the Netflix series. Um, that would be an example of someone who's basically channeling their chi into like one big attack from their hand. Um, it'd be a pretty cool, cool thing you have there. The tools of the trade for the true warrior is a melee weapon of their choice for use with the martial art of their choice. And then we come to our final professional. And this is definitely a last but not least situation. The Wheelman. Um, it's called Wheelman. That's the title. It does not matter the sex or gender of the character playing. You're still a Wheelman. Um, there are a lot of different ways that people can spend their time in Night City. And uh, Night City is a very vehicle-centric place, whether that is two wheels, four wheels, or flying through the air. Uh, the wheelman is the person who is the expert at all modes of transportation. Um, they might spend their day in underground drag races, or they might work as a mechanic for other people's speed machines. Um, but basically, they have the ability to hotwire a vehicle and take control of it. Anything that they fly, you know, find off the street, they can have the knowledge of flying AVs and hovercraft, as well as any grounders and jumpers that they find. Um, anything that they need at the time, they grab that vehicle, they can get it working, and they can make it work for you. Um, one of the coolest things about the Wheelman is that once your characters get access to vehicles, you can kind of elevate to that next stage of combat, which is vehicle combat, uh, where you would have vehicle-mounted weapons and literal dogfights in the air over Night City. As a result, the Wheelman has to have a prerequisite of a reflex of nine. Um, this gives them the, those fast twitch reflexes to pilot. They also have to have a body of six to withstand the sheer uh, speed and ferocity of their, you know, reckless driving through the streets or skyways of Night City. Their focus skills are cycle, drive, and pilot. And basically, that means that any vehicle they can get their hands on, they're going to know how to use no matter what. The tweak that they have is stunt driver. Basically, they are so used to pushing all vehicles and themselves to whatever limits they need 
that whenever they're doing some sort of crazy maneuver, performing a stunt, which is a type of combat or encounter action, uh, the character gets a 1d4 bonus on the relevant cycle, drive, or pilot skill check. So if you have a you know favorite scene from a you know high speed chase, whether that's land or air, and you see the character you know whip through a turn, drifting or jump down through the sewers, turn sideways and split between two buildings, any of that, that's your wheelman at work. And in the game of shadows, in the world of Night City, this is something that you need on your side. What's cool is that this tweak with the bonus stacks with the vehicular Zen advantage, which I would highly recommend anyone consider taking if they want to be a wheelman. And the tool of the trade is access to a single high performance vehicle of your choice. I should point out that vehicles in shadows are very expensive and outside of the price range for most characters. So having a wheelman on your crew means you start with somebody having access to a high performance vehicle. So that covers all of our different professionals that we have under the larger professional archetype. Um, which one is your favorite? You know, think about it. Let me know in the comments. Uh, when we're looking at professionals, you know, because they are human, they rely on the same set of basic human milestones, uh, which means heavily focused on advantages and skills. And what's cool about professionals is they don't have powers that anyone can kind of dampen, steal, or copy. Um, they rely on the tweak feature. That is their version of a power, but they're inherently human and they don't need those fancy supernatural powers. As a result, they also don't possess any vulnerabilities. So like a cyborg would have the vulnerability of an EMP blast or sanity loss, uh, fragmentation, things like that. You're Professional doesn't have to worry about those things. And so the result is that they may be a high performance human uh, that's all flesh and bone, no metal, no lace. So I hope that you enjoyed this look into the different professions. Like I said, we've got wheelman, true warrior, slayer, vigilante, decoder, skipper, mercenary, jack of all trades, fixer, enforcer, and cleaner. Which one's your favorite? Let us know. Which one are you looking forward to playing? And which one of these do you recognize from different forms of media? Movies, comic books, video games, stuff like that. As always, you can check us out on our Shadows RPG website at www.shadowsrpg.com. You can follow our gameplay activity every Thursday night on Twitch at twitch.tv slash decode, and that's D33KODE. Check us out on Twitter at Shadows RPG and uh, find us uh, all things to do with Get Dangerous Games at getdangerous.net. Thanks again, and I hope you check out this episode and the others. Take care. We'll